Welcome to Best in Class. My name is AJ Madden. I'm a coaching consultant. I help individuals and organizations become best in class at what they do. We have an outstanding guest today, Dr. April Detter. She's an award-winning entrepreneur and dentist. April graduated from Penn State University with a bachelor's in science in biochemistry and a minor in psychology. She went on to receive a doctorate of dental medicine from the University of Pittsburgh School of Dental Medicine. Her practice has been awarded Best of State College for five the last five years. Uh, Dr. Detter is passionate about serving in her community and has given her time to help treat dental patients at Center Volunteers in Medicine. She is a dedicated supporter of State College's Out of the Cold program for the Unsheltered. And uh, she's also passionate about the Mission of Mercy Pittsburgh and the United Way. And there's uh, there's honestly a lot more I could say about her volunteer work. This is a real, almost a bridge version of all the volunteer work that she does. Uh, she also volunteers to mentor future dental students through the Eberly College of Science at Penn State. She's married to her husband, Chris Magent. Did I say that right, Chris Magent? Yep. They have two. And how do you pronounce uh, the breed of your dogs? I don't want to say this wrong. And they're Shetland Sheepdogs, Miniature Collies. Okay, excellent, excellent. And uh, Chris and, and April, they uh, they love those two dogs with all their hearts, uh, Duke and Daisy. She also served on her first mission trip to Jamaica in the spring of 2019, where she took out over 100 teeth in just a few days and left uh, many Jamaicans smiling there. Yeah. And a lot more and a lot more volunteer work. Again, a bridge version. I want to welcome uh, Dr. April Detter to Best in Class. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, you're welcome. I was excited for this one. April's also uh, my dentist, full disclosure. And uh, we were talking earlier in the week uh, about just uh, what it takes to be best in class and excellence and service and high standards. And every time I, I go to her office, I experience that from the second I walk in till the second I leave, a full commitment to excellence and service to others. And that's what her practice is built on. And that's what it takes to win five best of awards five years in a row, you know, in a crowded market in a very short time, because she started her practice in 2017 and pretty much instantly started winning best of awards, which again, that takes as our definition of best in class is a hundred percent commitment to excellence and service. April, are you ready for uh, some questions? I sure am. And thank you for all that. Oh, uh, you're welcome. All, all a true story. It's all a true story. What are three key, three to five key mindsets that will help someone become best in class at what they do? Um, okay, so I think one of the first ones that I would probably say is, and I say it around my office all day long, constantly, is you can do hard things. Um, I think in the world that we live in now, things are more challenging. People tend not to really, some people tend not to push themselves as much as they probably should. And it's kind of easier to take the, the, lazier way out sometimes. And we can't do that as a society and as a group of people. So I know in my office, we are constantly hit with hard things all day long between patients, procedures, tech, all different things that happen. And so we kind of walk around with the mantra all the time, you can do hard things. Um, you have to come some, sometimes say it as well many, many times, but we can all do hard things. That's probably my first one. Um, my second one came from my fifth grade teacher. His name is Mr. Martz. He was amazing. He would walk around constantly and say to us, nobody ever said life was fair. Um, every time you have issues or problems or you see somebody getting something that you want or maybe you didn't get or work as hard for, you have a tendency to go, well, that's just not really fair. Why can't that happen for me? Or why isn't that happening? And life isn't fair. And it was never meant to be fair. You have to actually work at what you do and try hard at what you do to get success in what you do. So I do totally believe fifth grade taught me a lot in terms of that saying. Um, my last one probably would be, if you are the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I've learned that many, many times over in life in that it's comfortable. Sometimes you think I know everything and I know everything in my field and I can do so good and I can help people, but you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. So you have to be constantly looking to try to figure out how can I improve? How can I get better? What don't I know that if I did know, I would do better at doing and helping somebody else for it. So it's it's sometimes hard and sometimes a struggle, I think, to push yourself. But you do have to push yourself to go into a different room and learn something new. 
Oh, thank you for that. Three outstanding principles that, that we can really take away a lot away from. The, the first one, uh, we, you can do hard things. What a great message uh, to to remind people that because that's that is great for uh, our self esteem when we do hard things. Mm-hmm. That we can overcome hard things and we build up that resilience when bigger hard things come in life. That we've built that resilience up because hard things call, come to all of us, whether it's in our work, our health, our relationships. So if we if we're used to doing hard things, we we build up that strength and I call it putting uh, deposits in the bank account every day. So when we need that you know, that resilience, a rainy day comes and we need it. We've made a lot of deposits in the bank account. And uh, Dr. Stan Beecham, one of my favorite performance I call her, just talks about how doing uh, hard things uh, makes us live a fulfilled life. We, fe- we mm-hmm. feel fulfilled in life and it gives us purpose that we overcome hard things. So I really, really like that message. I love your message of uh, not being the smartest person in the room and just continuous learning. That is, you know, it's a great way to put it and it takes humility and it also takes confidence as well, right? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> uh, to do that, to show up in a room where you're not the smartest and the humility to say, I don't know everything and I want, there's always something I can learn and improve. So great advice for anybody, whether they're a business owner or, you know, a young person listening, uh, I love your three mindsets and just those three alone, uh, you know, just th- those three alone will give you a really complete system in life. It will. Uh, so thank you for that. How about three to five key daily habits that will help someone become my daily, daily habits. I'm going to steal one um, from a guy. He was, a, and I'm sure you've seen it. He did this commencement speech. He was a Navy Admiral. And sure. then he went on to write a book and I'll t- probably talk about the book too. Cause I really like that. And I was kind of motivated by that, but I'll steal his first one. I'll elaborate it on a little bit more, but his first one was, you know, always make your bed. And at my house, um, that doesn't really work. Cause my husband's usually still asleep. So I never actually get to make my bed. Uh, <laughs> but how I apply it is I always have certain tasks that I try to do at the beginning of the day. I always go into my job and there's a certain thing that I have to do before I'll see all my patients. So I look over everyone's charts and know exactly what's going on for the day before I will walk into a room like cold and start working on somebody. Um, And so it becomes, if you do that little task, that one task at the beginning of the day, it kind of sets you in motion for many other different things. Like as soon as you do one task, you go, all right, I accomplished something. Now I can move on and I can accomplish something else. And then as you build on those accomplishments, then you go, I can probably take on something harder. Like I can handle a bigger challenge. So when a bigger challenge comes along, you're like, I did already five things today. I can handle this. This is this is pretty simple. I can easily take on another challenge. And I think it makes you also motivated. Like it's my motivation of the morning. This is where I start. And then from here, I can kind of handle everything because I have a backbone of where I started in my day. So that's probably the first Um thing. The second thing I would probably say, and this one can be a little bit more challenging, um, but try to do something good for somebody else every single day, like one person every single day. So I'm fortunate in my life and I have tons of interactions. My whole day is interacting with people all day long. So I have many opportunities to be able to touch somebody else's life. And it's not like something huge where, oh, I have to go buy somebody this, this, or this. I'm not talking about, I mean, you can do that. That can be one of the things, but just a simple, like, how are you doing? Or a compliment to somebody can really set their day in motion and just change how they're thinking or, or, you know, what they're, what they're feeling. I have a lot of, um, because I have a lot of patient interaction and I've had a lot of patients, I've done this for a very long time. So I have a lot of good long time patients, but because they're patients for a really long time, they become more than a patient. Um, It's almost like an extended family per se, in terms of what you have. So I have many a time, and I'll give you one really good example about this, but I have many a time where I'll have a wife or a husband, somebody call me and say, hey, this is going on in this person's life. Is there any way you could maybe talk to them? And it's a weird, the dentist is a really weird relationship. People sometimes feel they can talk to you more than they can talk to their actual doctor. And they feel like maybe you'll spend a little bit more time and and care for them. And I, I pride myself in that I do care for people. Like I think that I do work on teeth, but I care for people more than I work on teeth. Mm -hmm. So like for an example, last week I had a patient who a terrible situation, but her husband 
um, had committed, tried to commit suicide. And luckily, thank God, luckily it did not occur, but he was obviously not doing very well and the family's having a hard time. And uh, the wife called me because I've known her for a really long time. She's like, he's so comfortable with you. He's just so comfortable with you. I'm going to tell you what happened. I don't care what you tell him, but I need you to go in and just talk to him so he knows there's somebody who's listening. And when I went into the room with him and I went in and I just said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm here. People care about you. I did talk to your wife. I gave him the background so he knew where I was coming from. And I mean, he just literally was like, thank you so much. Like, just thank you for touching my life. And, you know, by the time I got done with my conversation, and this is something I often do, but gave him my cell phone number. And I was like, if you need me for anything, just call. Like, I might be your dentist, but I'm also a human being. And in life, I kind of think we have to treat human beings. And, you know, I walked away from that. And his wife called me and she's like, that made my day. And I said, that made my day. You know, so it's like taking care of people and one thing a day, I think if you do one thing, whether it be that big or really small, it just makes you better and makes somebody else better. And then the last thing I'll say is I think, um, and it touched upon a point that we talked about a little bit earlier, but it's that con continuous learning. Like you have to be consciously learning, trying to find information, trying to make yourself better. In the field that I do, you know, everything I learned in dental school, we don't do. I don't do a single thing I learned in dental school. If I did what I did in dental school, I wouldn't have a single patient in my practice. Mm. So you have to seek out the information and learn and learn not only on a professional level, but on a personal level, too. Because, again, we're touching people's lives and affecting people. Mm. Oh, wow. brilliant answers. Brilliant answers. Brilliant principles once again, and I've experienced this as a patient there, all three of those things oh, thank that you, you. talked about. <laughs> and also, I know that you're all continuously learning. I, I know that uh, because you traveled yesterday. You had a full week of patients. You, would you fly or drive to Ohio and then flew back here? Yeah, today, I drove. Yeah. Drove, drove. To, okay, even worse <laughs> uh, or better, depending on <laughs> you, even more impressive. Uh, and, and then came back and did this podcast say on a Saturday afternoon. So uh, your, your dedication to serving others and also just being committed and pushing yourself to learn and grow. It's uh, I've seen you live it. And I, that's my favorite part about getting to interview great leaders and, and uh, high performers like you is that the things you talk about, I get to, you know, I know uh, that you live them as well. And that's the most important thing of all is to live by example as a leader, as anybody be what you want to see. That's the, by far the most important thing. Uh, people don't do what we say. They do what they see. And, uh, you know, I've seen you live these things, which is, uh, makes it even more powerful. Can you define excellence for me? What's your definition of excellence? Okay. Excellence. I, I kind of find that hard, a little bit hard. Um, I think excellence more as like a character trait, you know, I try to think of it, like, how would I define it? I think it's more of a character trait about people, um, when we're talking about people. So obviously excellence is being good at something. You're obviously the best at what you do. But I don't think you can be good at something for a really long time. I think that you can be good at something for like a short period of time. And that's excellent. But to have excellence, you have to keep striving for it. And it's that constant like perseverance, the the strive, the pushing yourself, trying to, to achieve more and attain the highest standards that you possibly can. Um, but I think it's a light, like I think excellence itself is more of a like a long process in order to just achieve it. And so, I don't know, I think excellence is hard to achieve, but I think we can do it, but you just got to keep working. You got to keep working at it. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. How about service? Can you define service? Um, I like service better. <laughs> uh, I think it's because of what I do, but service, I think of more as a, like, it's a verb, like it's an action word. It's a thing that you have to actually do. Um, it's the act of doing something for somebody else. And I think in order to have serve to, to do service, you have to be compassionate and you have to be caring and you have to be committed and you have to be able to like put someone else above you and a and in front of you and say, I'm not the most important thing right now. Somebody else is the most important thing. And I think service is something we should definitely strive for more. Like I think in high schools and middle schools, even I think getting kids exposed to, to doing volunteer work and to doing service projects is a way that you can grow because you don't, 
again, when you do a job and you do your job and you do it well and it goes well, it's one thing. But when you volunteer or you do service for somebody else, it's a different level. Like it's a way better. I think serving people is way better than actually doing my job. Like when I, we talked about Mission Mercy. When I go to Mission of Mercy, I mean, Mission of Mercy Pittsburgh last year, like we were to capacity. We served more than 1,500. The number might not be correct, but 1,500 people um, in two days. And they were 1,500 of the most gracious, thankful, and appreciative people that you'll ever run into. Like I see people all day long and people are thankful, but people that I see have, I live in a completely different world than most of the people that we serve when we do any kind of volunteer work. And in that capacity, those people are sicker than you could ever imagine and have different life conditions than most people in state college where we are fortunate enough to live. And helping those people, like you get done with them, you've just you taken out all their teeth, you know, and not in the best ways or with the best instruments. And they get up and they give you a hug and you just go, okay, this is why you serve because you're trying to help and affect somebody else's life. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Now, I love your idea of high schools, having people volunteer yeah. and serve in high schools. I think that's excellent. And I love that you put things in perspective for people that, you've got to put things in perspective that there's people out there who have much more difficult situations than others. And whether it's their health or they're unsheltered or physical health, mental health, there's just to, just to put that in perspective every day. Uh, you put it about as good as I've ever heard anybody put it in my life. So thank you for that. Are, are you ready for some rapid fire questions? And you can take as much time to answer them as you want. Uh, <laughs> okay. Here we go. Okay. What is one big hardship that you overcame in life, personal or professional, if you want to tell us? Okay. So that one's kind of hard for me. I thought about that one for a little while and trying to think of what, what is, what is that? Um, I could go so many ways. Cause I just feel like we all have suffered a lot of hardships in our life. I think everyone goes through stuff every single day that they can consider a really difficult hardship. I'll pick my business to talk about just because I think since we're kind of talking professionally, it might be a good place to work on it. But the biggest hardship I faced was, um, changing practices. So I'm obviously passionate about what I do. I like to do it. It's a big part of what I like of my life. Um, I got into dentistry because, you know, I had an issue myself and couldn't, no one else could kind of really take care of me or fix the problem. And I thought, all right, I'm going to go and figure out how to do this. I was motivated. I was driven. And then I started in a practice. Um, and as I grew into the practice, you know, I started as uh, an associate, then I became a full partner in the practice. And everything in my life was going great. Like things were good. I was doing good at what I was doing. I was helping people. I liked my environment and kind of thought I was on cruise control for a little while. You know, you get comfortable, a little comfortable in cruise control and never do that. Um, and as I was on cruise control, uh, I had an employee come to me and I'll spare you a lot of details. But, you know, she's like, here's a here's an issue we're having that I don't think you're aware of. And she made me aware of something. And then a month went by and I was trying to deal with that. And another issue came up and then tried to deal with that as well. And this was the cycle that happened for a couple of months. And finally, I realized it's not as it, these aren't challenges that I can fix. This is actually an ethical dilemma in my life. This is a big one. And at that point in my life, I had to face, am I going to look away, turn my head, put my head down, put it in the sand? And just kind of keep going? Um, or am I going to make a really hard choice and kind of scrap everything I've worked on for 17 years and scrap a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of commitment and just start all over again, walk away and start all over again? And it was a very challenging decision. I had many people weigh in on my life as to what I should or shouldn't do. And people are like, there's no way you're just going to walk away. And I was like, Finally, at the end of the day, I said, I can't continue to perform in a situation that is that I'm not happy with and I'm that I'm miserable doing and that I'm ethically compromised in. And so at the end of the day, I said, that's it. I'm walking away. Um, and I won't lie. That was really difficult to do. I was in a situation where everything was up against the wall for me. And I was like, that's it. I can do this, though. Like, this is what I want. I can do this. So. I walked out of my practice at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. I walked into my new practice at eight o'clock on a Monday morning with half my team and started all over again. 
Um, and I have never looked back since. Since that moment, it has been the best decision I've ever made in my life. It didn't matter. It didn't matter the money. It didn't matter the time. It didn't matter anything. Like it was, it was the right thing to do. And it was just choosing. It was making a hard, hard decision to do it. Mm. Yeah, that really goes back to your mindset of you can do hard things. Do hard things. <laughs> You can do hard things, really hard things. And that's tough to leave a situation like that and to not stick your head in the sand and to take that risk of a good situation you had there financial, I'm sure, you know, in your career Yeah, that it was, uh, and then you took that major leap. You can do hard things. Um, yeah. Great example of doing hard things. Yep. Who are three people you looked up to and learned from? Could be people in your life or people you learned from afar. Um, probably the people that I would, uh, look up to the most, I'd probably say first would be my dad. Um, I had a, uh, many people have, I had a difficult childhood, very bad divorce in my family, lots of, lots of different things. Um, but throughout the whole thing, my dad kind of also put us first. And as my dad put us first, he also made sure to tell us again, you can do hard things. Um, but he also made sure to tell us you can do anything you want to do right? So there aren't limits. The sky is not the limit. If there's something you want to achieve, you just got to figure out how to do it. And then you've got to lay out the pathway, follow the pathway and get it. You can learn anything in this world, but you actually have to take the time to do it and then perform it and you'll get it. Um, So I have to thank my dad a lot for that because I think he was the first person who believed. I felt like he really believed in me. And then I was like, I can do anything. He believes in me. I can, I can do this. So my dad, probably the first, um, the second was, uh, believe it or not, the my first boss that I worked for, um, Ed, he was, I, I'll never forget driving into town and going around with real estate agents looking for a house. And they said, are you really sure you want to work with him? Like, do you know that he makes people cry all the time? And he said, he doesn't make people cry all the time. And they said, Oh, people walk out, they cry all the time. And I said, oh, I'm not going to be somebody who walks out or cries. That is not who I am. I said, I can do this. I said, I'm I, I, no problem. And they were not that real estate agent was not wrong. <laughs> there were definitely situations where you could have wanted to cry, but you never did. Um, but, you know, that made me a harder person. I think that built my character. It gave me definitely a harder shell. You know, again, it was you can do hard things. Um, and he also pushed me. And I think having someone push you was great. Uh, he was never somebody who was like, okay, with status quo, status quo was never all right. Like, all right, you know how to do that. Now go learn how to do this. And when you're young, and you're first out of school, you have no idea again, what you don't know. And at the time, you know, I don't know if I would have necessarily pushed myself that far. And he was like, Nope, you're gonna go take that course next week. Nope, you're gonna take that course next week. And thank God I did all those things. And I thank him so much for that because I'm definitely the dentist who I am because of of him pushing me because most people don't, most people don't do those things. Like they just kind of go, Oh, I'm good. I'm good at what I'm doing. Um, and, and he said, no, you're, no, you're, he kept pulling the rug out from underneath you. So I do credit him so much for that. And then probably the last person that I would say is somebody you've never heard of. And most people who are listening to this never heard of. But in my career, it was, a again, it's another it's another older dentist. He's in his 80s. Um, his name was Gordon Christensen. But he was a guy who, again, didn't go with the status quo. And in, in most industries that we have, a lot of things are funded. And who it's funded by affects what the reviews are or what the outcomes are in the studies and everything like that. And he kind of said, I'm not going to go and do this. And he started a nonprofit organization. And in his nonprofit organization, they do all the testing. They test every material, every product that we get to use. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he puts out reviews and he puts out information on this. Like, this isn't really how it performs. This is actually how it performs. Like, Mm -hmm. don't believe the manufacturer. They've paid for the study. So their study is going to look better than what actually happens. And I do believe he has helped me keep my work to the highest level and my like the things that I use to the highest level so that we're giving people the best services that we possibly can. Okay. Wow. Three great mentors for three different things or three great, uh, you know, mentors, people you looked up to that really made you who you are, you know, the self-belief from your dad and you can do hard things and do anything. And then the toughness also from your second mentor. And then the third, that ethical 
uh, you know, highest standards of ethicalness. Is that a word? Ethicalness? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. I think it, it is. could be, <laughs> you know, just having good character as a professional. That's uh wow. Great examples there. Great examples. Makes me even, you know, more excited, you know, to be a patient, the standards are high, you know, as high as they get. Very high, yes. Uh, you, you just raise the bar even higher. Let's see. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would you choose? Could be yeah. a person you admire a lot, alive or passed on. Um, well, I'm a faithful person or I work on being a faithful person. So the person that I would pick um, would be Jesus. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, believing and I think we're here for a reason and we're meant here to do things and follow and, and be good people. And I would constantly say, if I could have dinner, like I even say this all day long in my practice, my pa- some of my patients will say, yes, she really does. Um, if I had, I had so many questions, like, oh, why are we acting the way we are? What is going on in our lives that are making humans act the way they are? Why are we in the positions that we're in? What was I meant to actually do? And why didn't I get the message the first time? Um, and then after I, probably got through all that I'd want to ask a lot more questions you know like why did you put this in this place anatomy in our anatomy like why is that tooth back there that's a terrible place for a tooth why did <laughs> why is it there I'm sure I wouldn't ever get to those questions but my patients hear me all the time saying things like that like I wouldn't have put the drain there the drain would be in here and now we have to do this because of this but I mean there's hands down no other person I'd want to have dinner with okay Oh, excellent choice. Beautiful choice. What is your favorite quote or quotes? Now that one's easy for me. Um, it's be the reason somebody smiles today. Um, that's, that's kind of the saying I adopted in my office and kind of what we're supposed to be doing in my office. You know, we should be trying to make someone smile. And again, it's not just about their teeth and profession. It's in life trying to make somebody smile. Okay. Excellent. One of my favorite slogans, uh, taglines, Ah, oh, that I mean, honestly, that even even diminishes it. Slogan or tagline? I mean, it's just <laughs> what goes on there in that office. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that one because I saw it on the business card and I thought, yeah, that's a good one. That is a good one. And that's a again, it's a true story in my experience there at the office. And it's a great life philosophy to have. If you make no matter if you're having a terrible day yourself, if you go make someone else smile, you pretty much forget about that bad day. So everybody ends up winning. You know, you're giving somebody else a smile, right? You're putting a smile on your face in turn. So it's, uh, I, re- I really like that philosophy. What are three of your favorite uh, personal development books, biographies, or, you know, any books you want to share? Um, so I'm not the biggest reader, which is what I kind of shared with you a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. but my husband's the biggest reader. And my husband reads more books than, than anyone. He's a big leadership person. He's always giving me, read this, read this, read this. I'm always going, I have to read this. I'm always reading stuff for, for work. So I'm constantly reading stuff for work. So it doesn't leave me as much time as I wish it did. Um, but the three development books, I would probably say the first one was the one I alluded to earlier. Um, and it was um, Make Your Bed. It's by William McCraven. Sure. And again, yeah, I think his books, like I think his book is really well. And I think some of the things that like that I would highlight in it is, again, you know, one of his other philosophies or points where, you know, you need people in life to be able to help you paddle like we're not in this alone. Um, you need somebody who's also going to be on your side. And that's what's going to help you in life a lot. I find that the most in my office as well, like without my team, I couldn't do what I do. Like, there's no way they do so many different things that help me so much that without them, I, I'd be a nothing compared to where I am with a team. And I think that's in life as well. Also, you know, he talked about, you know, you have to be, you know, your greatest in the darkest moments. And I find that in my life too, especially with what we do, because in my profession, it's kind of like, you're seeing people constantly over and over. So it's mini crisis after mini crisis after mini crisis. And things don't always go the way people want them to go. And many times they don't go the way people want them to go. And you also have to be able to kind of maintain that calm, you know, in the middle of that storm. And there's always storms going on. So I think that's a that's a big thing that I've, I've learned from that book um, and I appreciate um, t- three more things out of that book and then I promise I'll move on. But, um, you know, one of them is, Make sure that you don't back down to sharks, which we talked about a little bit earlier today. You know, I always feel like it is life is a little bit of a -a whack-a-mole. Like we're constantly like, you got to keep attacking them because they just keep coming at you. So you just got to keep hitting. 
Um, he also in the book talked about, you know, never, never ring the bell, you know, never give up. You can't give up. You got to keep fighting and keep trying um, and keep learning. And sorry about that. I think that was that was me. Um, and then the last thing that he talked about was hope. There's always hope. So you always have to have hope. So at the end of the day, hope will always get you through to the next day and to the next chapter of your life. So that's one book. Another book that I liked, um, again, it's a small book, so it's not a large, like long leadership book, but it was called The Butterfly Effect. And that's okay. by Andy Andrews. And again, that's about how like we all have a ripple effect, like how we interact with other people affects everything. So, you know, you don't realize it, but how you treat other people really is more important than you realize. Um, every, every life that you touch, every action that you do, every word that you say, you know, they all matter and they all create something down the pathway that touches or affects somebody, somebody else, um, in life. And I'll give you one example here. Um, again, it's going to be of course from work, <laughs> but, um, it, my example is I, I had a patient and I'd seen again, patients for a long time, I, again, long time person in what I do. And uh, his wife suffered a lot. She suffered a lot in her life. Um, she was an alcoholic, but she was a wonderful, amazing person. She just had alcoholism as one of her demons. And he knew it. I knew it. We struggled a lot throughout her throughout her life. And she, they had children and the children, same kind of situation. But in my office, you know, if somebody passes away, I always like to know. So somebody tells me I'm always happy. But every single person who passes away, the family gets a sympathy card from me. Because they're somebody who has let me into their life. They let me touch their life. They trust me. They've chosen me. Um, and I feel like I deserve them the respect of trying to thank them and appreciate them back as well. So um, I happen to send him a sympathy card, you know, and of course, in my sympathy cards, I always try to touch that person. It's a personal thing. It's not like, hey, I'm really sorry. It's a, I appreciate all this. This is what we've been through our whole lives together, blah, blah, blah. Um and then he, it wasn't a long time after that, he came in and I walked into the room and he just said, he, he said, I cannot thank you enough. He's like, the day I got your sympathy card, I needed it more than you knew. He's like, that was a horrible day for me. I was, you know, I was terrible. You talked about my daughter and you talked about my wife. And he goes, and that gave me the courage to keep going in that day. And it's just another principle of the butterfly effect. Like you would not think that, you know, I, when I wrote the card, I was just trying to thank them and, you know, be appreciative. I was not expecting to change that man's, you know, entire day. But again, every little word or every little thing we do does, does have an effect on every other person in our lives. So I really, I really enjoyed and uh, believe in that book. Um, again, I'm a faithful person. So my last one's going to obviously be the Bible. Um, I, I found the Bible is the hardest book to read. I still haven't been able to read it or completely comprehend it or, um, master it. Obviously I, I like the book on Proverbs the most because I think it's the most uplifting book in the whole situation. Um, and, um, so those are my books. <laughs> okay. Oh, outstanding choices. You'll have me thinking about the butterfly effect for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an important one to think about. Okay. What's an inspiring or educational documentary or movie or TV show you'd recommend to our audience? Okay. So Do you have that, time to watch? Do you have any time to watch? <laughs> Not anything? a lot. I don't watch a lot, but I'll, I'll go back to like my childhood. Um, if you remember like Rocky one, sure. <laughs> um, Sylvester Stallone, you know, way back in the day. Um, I, I like that movie. I think a lot again, because it's an inspirational movie. You know, it was about the underdog being able to to triumph. It was about not giving up. It was about, you know, hard work pays off, you know, in the end. And um, Sylvester Stallone's con or one of his quotes in the movies that, that I'm going to just briefly read to you, but I believe in a lot is, you know, it, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. And I think that kind of says a lot and that you're, we're always going to get hit. You're going to get hit constantly from every different angles, but you've got to be able to take the hit and figure out how you get up and keep walking. And so I really liked Rocky. <laughs> you might not have thought that. <laughs> Excellent choice. That's a good one. Well, that's close to my heart for sure. The Rocky. 
Rocky movie. That's one of my favorites as well. Let's the first see. one was the best though, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to beat the first one. Yeah, yeah. It is hard. How about your proudest accomplishment? What are you proudest of? Okay. So they think about accomplishments. I'm a, a very proud of a lot of things I've done business wise and at work, obviously, but probably not the most proud. Um, probably the most proud accomplishment that I have is, is probably my marriage. Um, when again, it'll allude to my childhood, but you know, after going through a lot as a child and lots of divorce, and it was not a good relationship going on. And also I have a sibling who suffer, suffers from um, mental illness as well. So lots of different things have touched me in my life. And going through that as a kid and as you grow up, you kind of just become a little uh, maybe cold, maybe more distant. You kind of pull back a little bit, I think, in life just because you're like, gosh, I can't take anything else. Um, but you can always take you can always take a little bit more. And believe it or not, it was actually my brother that I talked about who led me to my husband, which, you know, weird life, how things go. Um, but I at first I didn't never thought I'd wanted to get married. I thought I'm not doing that. There's no way I want to do this in my life. Um, but when I met my husband and actually did get married, he kind of broke down that tough shell to the person who I kind of was before that tough shell. And, you know, you know, taught me again that, you know, you can live and you can have love and you need these things in life. And you don't know my husband, but for anybody who would know my husband, you go, that can't be your husband, but it is my husband. Because <laughs> he's kind of a really tough character too. Um, but I, I think that the the accomplishment of being married for the past 24 years, I think is my, my proudest accomplishment. Um, and we have an agreement, you know, I will die first. So I'm done. This is it. There will be, there will not be a divorce for me. He gets to marry again when I die. We said in our vows. So um, again, I think, I think that's probably my um, proudest accomplishment. Yeah. I say uh, great story. Great story. <laughs> what is one piece of advice you'd give someone starting out in their business or career? Oh yeah. So I would probably say, don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask every question that you can think of. Um, there's no dumb questions. Like there's there's only good questions and there's no dumb answers also. You can learn from every single person in a different way. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, myself included, would think, oh, you know, when I started out in my career, I might not have wanted to ask the question. Oh, I don't know the answer. Or I don't know the background. So I don't want to ask the question. But if you would have just asked that question, it would have made life so much easier because someone might have answered it and unlocked a door to be able to move on, you know, to another question that I had. And I think a lot of us are just afraid to ask the questions. And I don't think so. I think ask questions. I think find groups that are interested in the same things that you're interested in, because they probably have looked at it a different way or might have a different concept that could help you, again, figure out your answer or come up with a better solution. And I think just talking to other people and not being afraid to ask the questions, I think would be helpful. That's a very common theme amongst, I've been fortunate to have some uh, incredible guests on the show, yourself obviously included. And that's a, that's a common theme is ask questions, ask for help. So if anyone out there is listening to this yeah. and is, needs help with something, whether it's professional or personal, ask questions, ask for help, find a group, find people, I think yeah. that's really, really important, just as you described it there. And I just want to pause on that one because not enough people do that uh, when they need it and they should for whatever reason, fear or just not knowing to do it. So do what uh, Dr. April says and ask questions, ask for help, surround yourself with groups who, who can help you and know things you don't know. And again, extra common theme, just a common theme uh, in all these great experts we've been able to have on the show. If you could give... Go back. If you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Is it only one piece or can I give myself a couple? Of <laughs> sure. <laughs> because I have so many. Right. Um, I, I would say the first one would be never take no for an answer. No is never an answer. You are already at no. We start at no. So if you start with that and you accept that, you might limit yourself more than you might have otherwise. So definitely never take no for an answer. Um, second would be, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, which, you know, they wrote a book and said a lot of things about that. Um, we, sometimes things seem so large at the time, but you got to, again, find perspective. 
and realize, is this really going to affect me in five years? This is, if this is not going to affect me in five minutes or five years, make the decision, just make the decision and, and, and move on because probably it's not that life altering. Um, and don't get too worked up about it. Um, probably I'd say take time to smell the roses and enjoy your life for sure. You know, where I work really hard and I work a lot and there's a lot of people who work really hard, but you do have to take some time to find fun and excitement in your life because you've got it. You've got to have a balance. And then the last one I'd probably do, of course, would be do unto others what you would have done to you. You know, I look at that constantly, you know, people say to me in my practice all the time, what would you do if this was you, what would you do? And I always go, I only tell you what I would do. Like, this is exactly how I would do it if I'm telling you to do it that way. And I think professionally and personally, again, it comes back to how we're treating and taking care of other people. Oh, excellent advice to end the show on. That was uh, outstanding. I, I love that. That's just great life advice for whether it's our you know 18-year-old self or ourself today. Uh, really good advice to take You know, for all of us. Dr. April, where can listeners find you online if they want to find you in your practice? Where, where should everyone go? Um, I guess I, I know I don't look for myself online, but I guess if you wanted to look for me online, we'd be at dentistrybyaprildotter.com. Um, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Great place to find you. It's good. A good solid website. I got the bio off there. It's, uh, yeah, you can learn more about, uh, what Dr. Detter does. And I want to acknowledge all the volunteer work, the humanitarian work that you do locally across the country and really across the world. I mean, you've been to China, Jamaica, uh, where else? Um, those are the only two out of out of the country places I've been so far. But I have a hygienist who's going to the Dominican Republic in a couple of months. I just couldn't do it because I have a conflict. But next year, hopefully several of us will go to the Dominican Republic, too. OK, yeah, well, you're well on your way, uh, you know, with all the service you're doing again around the world in our right here in, in State College and then you know, across the United States, it's just impressive. And I don't know how you find that time to do it, but you make the time to do it. So you make it a priority as busy as you are. And I know how busy your practice is very successful practice. You still make the time to, uh, for your faith and your family and your, uh, volunteer work, which is uh, impressive. So I appreciate, uh, all your wisdom, expertise, positive energy, service, knowledge, and uh, everything you've given us today, Dr. April. Thank you. You're great. So thank you so much for the opportunity and for getting to talk to you a little more. Oh, excellent. I enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, doctor. All right. Thank you.